morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the 2023 Rule of Law Webathon Week, organized by the American Bar Association's International Law Section, or ABA ILS, AJA, which is the International Association of Young Lawyers Human Rights Committee, the Inter-American Bar Association, and the Institute for the Rule of Law of the International Association of Lawyers. My name is Dina Hurwitz. I'm a human rights lawyer based in Charlottesville, Virginia in the United States. And among other things, I'm a division chair in the ILS and a member of the board of the ABA Center for Human Rights. Uh, this panel presented by the ABA uh, ILS and the International Commission of Jurists will discuss counterterrorism, human rights and the rule of law. We're the sixth of nine panels being offered during this webathon week dedicated to exploring, analyzing, and presenting perspectives on this year's theme, which is upholding the rule of law in challenging times. Now, before I present our panelists, I want to thank the International Commission of Jurists, the ICJ, for co-sponsoring the program with us. It's my pleasure to introduce Santiago Canton, the ICJ Secretary General, to say a few words on their behalf. Mr. Canton is an Argentine jurist who was Secretary of Human Rights for the province of Buenos Aires from 2016 to 2019. Uh, among many distinguished roles, he was Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights from 2001 to 2012. And before that was the Commission's Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression. He was the executive director of the Human Rights Program of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights in Washington, D.C., and he's also served as chair of the U.N. Commission of Inquiry on the 2018 protests in the occupied Palestinian territory. Santiago, Mr. Canton, yeah, the floor is yours. Will you? You are muted. Thank you very much, Dina, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. And uh, thank you the, the uh, Inter-American Bar Association as well, and the American Bar Association, and all the organizers for putting together this uh, very relevant uh, panel uh, today. Uh, uh, you know, for the situation, reconsidering the situation of the world today. Let me just say a, a couple of things to to introduce the start the discussion. Um, when I was uh, executive secretary of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights back in, in 2000, 2001, uh, the September you know, September 11 attacks in the USA had a strong, strong impact in the Inter-American system as well, uh, for several reasons. Of course, first, because of what happened that day, but also that day was the day that Inter-American Democratic Charter was signed in Lima, Peru. Uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell was in Peru signing the the, the first Charter of Democracy for the Inter-American system and for the world. It was the first time that uh, Charter to support democracy and the rule of law was being signed. And that day was the September 11 attack. So it did have an enormous impact all over the Inter-American inter -American system. The first reaction was very strong uh, support to the U.S., but after that came a sort of a strong concern that uh, the attacks could have an impact in the respect for human rights throughout the world, that could have an impact in issues that historically were not uh, being uh, discussed, were like the pro prohibition of torture or due process. Uh, and, and, and the concern was that in order to counterattack terrorism, the the country will start to to delay or to to soften a little bit the the support for human rights, uh, and that did happen, and that did happen, and, and many of the uh, situations we've seen all over the world since since that time, I think, are originated in that uh, to some extent in that September 11 attack. Now. At that time, of, as I said, I was the executive secretary of the commission, and the commission immediately started considering the history of Latin America and the history with fighting terrorism in Latin America and fighting it not in a very good way in Latin America, as you all know, in the 60s or the 70s. Uh, the Inter-American system considered back then the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, which had a you know, really great participation of excellent uh, 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 lawyers like uh, 
uh, Juan Mendez, uh, Jose Salaquet from Chile, Bob Goldman from the US, they decided that the region could make a good contribution to this discussion and, and to try to break that false dilemma of, you know, if you want to have security, you have to have less, less human rights. So uh, we produced a report back then, I think it was published in 2005, and I was reading, precisely preparing for this discussion, uh, uh, that I was rereading that report again. And many of the issues are still very, very relevant today. But let me just name uh, one or two. One is part of the discussion when, when uh, the Commission was drafting the report was the idea that international law uh, has to evolve you know, during different periods periods in history, international law had to change in order to adapt to new circumstances. Um, and uh, the new technologies and, and the new <clears throat> participation, not the new, but the, an increased participation of governments sponsoring terrorism, probably, the Commission said back then, probably will, in the future, we will have to reconsider certain aspects of international law. Uh, this idea that, you know, there is always a, con you need always to think about a constant evolution is international law is a, is a living, is a living document to some extent. Uh, so that, that was one aspect. And the other one was the issue regarding the advance on technology, on, on both on the, on the, uh, possibility of different type of terrorist attacks and also on the response that the government can 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 uh, use in order to counterattack uh, terrorism so those two issues were raised by the commission back then and when you look at the situation right now those two issues are still very relevant uh, and and we, we are seeing it happening right now but basically regarding Technology. If back then, you know, 15 years ago, we were thinking about uh, technology changing every year. Right now, the technology is changing by the hour, uh, and and with that, we have in addition to that, we have artificial intelligence, which also which also is putting a lot of uh, uh, new things that we are not used to it, and will will challenge again this issue of of fighting terrorism. So that's why I think this this panel is really. Uh, important at this stage and we need to have, continue this discussion because the situation is going to continue to grow in the in the coming years and uh, one of the things and with this I finished Dina one of the things that I believe is uh, uh, critically important is uh, all this is happening in a context that like never before in history there is a very strong deterioration of the rule of law all over the world uh, I can I can talk about my region, Latin America, uh, after you know the third wave of democracy and 40 years of democracy to many countries, the best period in history. Right now, there is a very strong advance of uh, uh, those who uh, governments that do not respect the rule of law at all. Um, many countries today in the region are no longer democracies. Uh, and and that that's happening in other regions of the world as well. So in that context, with a clear deterioration of the rule of law, we need to find ways by which we can defend human rights, we can fight back terrorism, but ensuring that the individual's rights are continue to be will continue to be respected. So with that, uh, again, Edina, thank you very much for uh, put, you know helping to put together this event, and I give the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago, for framing the the issue so perfectly, and um, and we're we're really privileged to have. Uh, well, this this panel is is some of the we have some of the best people. Sorry for uh, to to explore these issues, but I want to start with saying how privileged we are to have uh, Fanula Nialon with us today, Professor Nialon served since 2017 as the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights while countering terrorism. She's University Regents Professor at the University of Minnesota. She's Rubina Chair in Law, Public Policy and Society and Faculty Director of the Human Rights Center at the University of Minnesota Law School and is currently concurrently a Professor of Law at Queens University of Belfast School of Law. Uh, next, we uh, will have uh, Noreen Chowdhury Fink, 
the executive director of the Sufan Center, an independent nonprofit uh, organization working on foreign policy challenges with a particular focus on global security, conflict prevention and resolution and the rule of law. Ms. Chowdhury Fink previously served as senior policy advisor on counterterrorism and sanctions at the UK's mission to the UN. And before that, she worked with UN Women and UN Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. And last but not least, it's my pleasure to also welcome Lana Bedas. Ms. Bedas is Program Director at the ABA Center for Human Rights. In her distinguished international career, she was a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where, among other things, she managed the International Consortium on Closing Civic Space. She served in multiple positions and locations with, uh, with the UN, including Geneva, Lebanon, and West Darfur, Sudan, and before that with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Syria. So uh, welcome, thank you all. And now, um, Fanula, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be on this panel, particularly with this distinguished group of participants. So I thought in the five minutes that I'm going to kick off a conversation, I'd really talk about my observations as Special Rapporteur over the past um, six years and what we've seen on the current state of counterterrorism and as a by way of corollary, the implications of human rights for human rights and the rule of law across the globe. And I think it's worth noting counterterrorism is not new. We've had terrorism has been a challenge for many states for many, many, uh, for many, many decades. And um, I think it's worth noting that one of the challenges as we think about terrorism in the contemporary moment is what's changed, what's new, and how do we really understand the veracity of claims about the newness of challenge um, and whether or not the tools that we've historically used to confront terrorism are, uh, are, are fit for purpose today. I think the one thing while acknowledging the quote oldness of terrorism is also to acknowledge the extent to which we've seen a massive shift in the global regulation of counterterrorism since 2001. So 9-11 is an extraordinary event in the scale and the harm of the devastation that took place during that period. But I think what's also important about is what the architecture and institutional changes, as well as the normative changes that the events of 9-11 wrought. Most distinctly, they had this extraordinary impact on the UN itself. We have the UN Security Council, the creation of a sub-entity called the Counterterrorism Committee, a special political mission established and states being given the obligation to report on their counterterrorism practices directly to the Security Council. That was really birthed in a resolution, UN Security Council Resolution 1373, which just to get sort of pernickety and lawyerly for a minute, this is a unique resolution in the sense that it creates a set, not just chapter seven resolutions always create binding res uh, obligations for states, but it does something quite specific in that it creates le legislative obligations for states absent a definition of the phenomena that's being regulated. So you get an ultimatum to states to regulate terrorism, but the discretion as to how states regulate terrorism is entirely left to the state itself to decide what that phenomena of terrorism is. And from that birthing space of, in a sense, discretion and sovereignty to member states to decide what is and is not terrorism, what we've seen, I think, in my view, from where I sit, is an extraordinary expansion of the scale, scope, and what, of, of what constitutes terrorism at the national level. And in a sense, if we if we talk about genuine terrorism, that which I think is encapsulated by the 19 sectoral treaties that are established by states through multilateral processes to regulate terrorism, we have clear definitions of what are acts of terrorism. And but it, we've moved a long, long way away from definitions of clear acts of terrorism. And one of the things my mandate does is we review national legislation. <clears throat> that addresses terrorism regulation uh, at the national level. And what I can say is that without exception, what we're seeing at the national level over the past 20 years is the proliferation of an extraordinary bundle of national legislation, again, driven by the Security Council imperative. But what comes with it is extraordinary latitude to states <clears throat> to define terrorism however they like. And really, it's a gentleman's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a free ride for states and what we've seen from that free ride is an extraordinary and negative impact on the protection of human rights across the globe. Because when states don't 
either have to define terrorism within a constrained universe, and B, when they report on their activities to counter terrorism in a process that's entirely secret, meaning there's no transparency to the reports that states give, unlike the reports that come to human rights bodies, we actually have very little access to understanding what states are in fact doing and how they are held to account for their abuse of counterterrorism practices. <clears throat> so I would say we've seen this extraordinary expansion at the national level. We're seeing governance by counterterrorism, meaning states can use the legal framework of counterterrorism to go a great deal at the national level and are doing so across multiple states and multiple regions. But to go back to where I started, we're also seeing this expansive growth of global counterterrorism architectures, the consolidation of legislative power and counterterrorism at the Security Council, which my mandate has been consistently critical of, because in many ways, the process of the ways in which Security Council resolutions are passed are inherently non-democratic. They're supposed to be. That was the way the charter was created. But that's really been, it has meant that historically, states exercise what we might call judicial, some kind of judicious restraint over what did and did not get legislatively dealt with on the council. That judicious restraint has not been evident in counterterrorism. And so that expansion, institutional expansion, allied with a normative expansion on the council. In parallel, just as we close out, we could think about other institutions that have expanded over the past number of decades. On the General Assembly side of the House at the UN, we've had the creation of an Office of Counterterrorism, which is might be a surprise to many of the call, is the fastest growing part of the UN. We're two decades on from 9-11, but the largest single sort of growth infrastructure at the United Nations lies in counterterrorism. And again, one of the concerns is it lies in a context where it's not clear that actually much of the counterterrorism that we've done over the past two decades has delivered for member states. And we know that because we continue to have rising threats of terrorism or things that are called terrorism at the national level or violent extremism. But equally, we see little or no solutions to what the fundamental, the conditions conducive, the drivers that produce that violence at national level. And one of the things that has always enormously surprised me as Special Rapporteur, not just at the UN, but also at national level when I do country assessments, assessments within member states, is how little monitoring and evaluation we have of counterterrorism. Like at a simple policy level, states might want to know if these kinds of measures work or they don't work. And what we've seen is fairly consistent disinterest in the sort of standard operating procedures of good policy making in counterterrorism, simply in part because I think the consequences of knowing that information might have enormous implications for the way in which budgets get spent and decisions get made. So maybe to sort of outside of the UN, let me highlight a couple of other key facets of this kind of growing and expansive global counterterrorism architecture. And we see it in the rise of what are selective clubs, these kinds of institutions that are not multilateral in the traditional sense. I think of the Financial Action Task Force as an example of that. They're not treaty making bodies, but they do have enormous normative and policy implications for states. If you're a state who's gray listed by the FATF, you know that your banking system System is in trouble. So in an odd sense, we have this confluence of counterterrorism interest between the classic institutions, but then these more nebulous institutions of international standing, whose status is indeterminate, but whose policy and practice is enormously persuasive on state behavior. We also have other kinds of clubs. We have the Shanghai Framework Agreement led by China and Russia. We have the Global Counterterrorism Forum. So when states can't get what they want in multilateral fora, where they go is they go to other places where they think they can advance their strategic security interests. And that rebalancing of security interests, both inside and outside the UN, again, has had this enormous impact on the state of the rule of law, on the state of governance, and on accountability for misuse of counterterrorism practice. A final piece of this architecture that I think is worth highlighting is the, highlighting is the increased um, presence um, of public-private partnerships in a lot of these spaces. I think of the GIFCT, the Global Internet Forum uh, to Regulate Terrorism, Tech Against Terrorism. We see numerous kinds of interfaces between the private sector, particularly the private sector that has an interest in either um, global security assets 
or in uh, technology assets interfacing, interfacing with states around regulation. And that is a lethal cocktail in my view for human rights. It's a lethal cocktail for governance. And it's generally a lethal cocktail for the transparency of the kinds of norms and practices that gets produced along the way. Let me close by saying two things. The first is that as a the global study that my mandate is going to issue is issuing this June at the at high level week in New York addressing the impact of counterterrorism on civil society and civic space over the past two decades will show and has shown, I think, mandate holders like myself, is that the impact of counterterrorism on civic space and civil society has been enormous, consistent, detrimental, discriminatory and structurally enabled to ensure that there are few constraints on the willingness and capacity of states to continue to engage in the kind of regulation that has these negative effects. The second comment I would make, and it goes to um, Santiago's comments about new technologies, which I think are an enormous part of the conversation. One of the things that worries me is that often we see the arguments for many new technologies from spyware, to biometric data collection, to the use of uh, drones is security. In many places, the edge of the argument to adopt these, to, for frontline adoption of these technologies is security or counterterrorism. And we've seen that in a number of areas. Security is probably the worst place to start in the terms of the adoption of new technologies if we're going to ensure adequate governance, accountability, and oversight of those technologies. And one of the things that concerns me greatly has been the kind of forward lean of counterterrorism allied with proprietary interests of the, um, the sectors that produce, whether it's drones or, or, um, or spyware, or as two examples, or biometrics, is that um, that is exactly the wrong place to be starting, either in the regulatory or in the institutional space. Um, and I think it's always premised on the presumption that terrorists are going to have access to these technologies. And I'll just close by saying that actually we have evidence of some terrorist take up of these technologies, but it's limited. My most recent report on spyware addresses the kinds of ways in which non-state groups have access to new technologies. The same with, with drone use. But it is to say that the threat of misuse by UN, by member states, is far higher in these technologies than the use by non-state armed groups as an empirical matter. And it should be that fundamental fact that drives the conversation about regulation rather than any other. So let me stop there. Thank you, Fanula. Um, before I uh, welcome uh, Noreen Chowdhury Fink, I want to, um, excuse me, um, I wanted to just mention that, that uh, after the, our panelists speak, um, uh, Santiago and I will pose some questions, but we'll then open it up to the to participants for your comments and your questions. And uh, please do write them in the Q&A. You, you probably realize that the chat is, um, is uh, disabled. So we will be monitoring the Q&A and um, look forward to your questions and feel free to direct them to one or more of the panelists. So thank you. Um, Noreen. Thanks, Dina. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to be here as part of this panel. So thank you for the invitation. And it's always a tough act to go after Finola. So everything I thought I was going to say, I've now annotated and crisscrossed. And I don't know if I'll make any sense, but I'll give it a shot. And I know um, we have a great panel here who can always cross check and correct me as we go along. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about the evolution of Security Council resolutions and where human rights has factored in, and I think there's been some allusion to that. I think one of the most important things or notable features of 1373, besides what Finola mentioned, is that it didn't really mention human rights. And there wasn't really a discussion on human rights at all for the first couple of years. Now, um, a lot of that is because I think Santiago put it quite gently that human rights uh, was, shall we say, swept aside in a violent wind, um, stormy wind um, in pursuit of security post 9-11. And we've seen the effects of that. But also, you know, if I want to be kinder uh, to think that, you know, it was recognized that human rights obligations exist outside the, the Security Council's counterterrorism resolutions, their pre-existing obligations. Um, and so when states sometimes say that, you know, it's not in there, it's, it's great to remind them that <laughs> the obligations were there 
all along, even if they weren't referenced. However, we did see, you know, one of the interesting things has been that since then and all the resolutions, there is this language, right, about um, compliance with international law, compliance with international human rights law. And I think over the years, certainly a number of states have um, have shared and you know shared the revelation um, that human rights is in fact integral to more credible, sustainable counterterrorism responses. And you know at the same time we've seen that dangerous sort of sweeping aside of of human rights in some aspects. We've also seen a realization on you know on the other side that violations of human rights have in fact um, helped propel some of the the grievances and the concerns that we see driving terrorism those conditions conducive that Finola talked about and so sure we've seen a lot more human rights language in in the CT resolutions and I don't want to you know I don't want to dismiss that because I've seen over the last couple of decades how hard it's been to fight just for that language to begin with. And it, it is disturbing how much of a fight it sometimes is to get in what we can sometimes consider innocuous language, right? But it's a huge fight to get it in. And I think it's important to recognize that. The challenge, of course, is that over the past 20 years has been this proliferation of CT resolutions. I think we're talking at 45, if I wanna think CT, CT related coming out of the CTC. And then there's sanctions and all sorts of other resolutions in the GA. But, you know, as has been alluded to, there really hasn't been any accountability mechanism built in. So we've got the obligations written in now that you should absolutely comply with international human rights law and that states should certainly um, shape their counterterrorism measures um, in line with these expectations set out in the resolution. But, you know, there's no effort to hold states accountable who misuse it. Now, what I find interesting is that's not just the work of five states, as, as a lot of times people you know, allude to, because in, in the past 20 years, we've seen almost 90 plus states um, go through the Security Council, probably more since my last count, deconflicting a few repeat members. And it's interesting that in all that time, there has not been a huge push for such an accountability mechanism, there has not been a huge push um, for changes in the working methods of the council. And so I think there is that, you know, consensus among states that um, accountability in this form is going to be tricky. And, and, you know, the reality is no one wants that light shun on them. But I think it is important that um, this lack of accountability mechanism is where the, the crux of the matter is not the fact that it wasn't recognized in the language. And so states that misuse these CT resolutions, as Finola alluded to, there's been zero accountability. And I think that is really important because communities and citizens and civil society and the media, everyone is watching this. So we all get reports, right? States are misusing CT laws to lock up journalists, women who drive and, you know, for any minor infraction. And certainly that breeds further um, further of a, I'd say further is a trust deficit, right, between citizens and the state. And so I think the lack of this accountability mechanism, you know, the dangers go so far beyond the council because everyone is watching these CT resolutions or CT laws um, be misused. And I think that's also dangerous for good CT. You know, most CT practitioners do focus on security because they want, you know, people to stay safe. It's not good for CT and it's not good for human rights. And I think that is actually quite important. And I don't think that gets said enough. Um, but you know, we see that disillusionment continue to foment and undermine efforts to impose the rule of law and promote security. I think another challenge with accountability has been that also perpetrators of crimes have not really been held accountable. We see a lot of misuse of CT legislation and you know, directed often at the wrong folks. But then when there are perpetrators of terrorist crimes or, or you know, related war crimes or crimes committed by terrorist groups that are not war crimes, but other kinds, um, there's been very little push for accountability, meaningful accountability. And I think that also um, foments another kind of um, disillusionment because for all the talk on, you know, how, how awful ISIS was and how dangerous and all that, there's there's really been very few ways to hold ISIS writ large accountable for what it did and, and similar for many groups. So I think that accountability deficit on both ends has been really dangerous. Um, it, it, it makes that rhetoric of human rights sound like it's just rhetoric after 20 years, right? No one who's misusing it is being held um, 
accountable. And Santiago alluded to that at the outset, that this is taking place, you know, in a climate where accountability is not a priority for a ton of states on either way. And we're seeing a dangerous backsliding. So um, I think that's that's been a particularly dangerous dynamic. Are there tools? Okay, so we're 20 years in, what can we do about it? Because we have these resolutions on the books. We have, you know, I'm not sure there's always a direct causal relationship, but we've certainly seen uh, between the council and, and some of the things that states do, but we've certainly seen that counterterrorism rhetoric uh, be applied time and time again for infractions. So what can we do? Um, you know, the UN itself doesn't have a ton of tools. I mean, um, Finola uh, alluded to the work of CTED and Yes, having been on several several visits, I can say this this subject is often quite thoroughly interrogated, including you know the the extent of the definition, the vagueness of the definition, the the um, accountability mechanisms, the sort of processes for redress. These are often addressed in um, in visits quite extensively, but then, as Finula noted, the reports are not really publicly available, and and so that becomes challenging because you have all this effort to sort of monitor compliance and you know, promote a dialogue where these things can be challenged and, and the concerns of the human rights mechanisms of the UN can be brought to states and to their counterterrorism professionals. But again, if you don't see enough of those reports and you don't see enough follow-up, it raises questions about what the end game is there. So what tools do we have? The counterterrorism committee could always always change the working methods of the committee, and if council members so choose, those reports could be more quickly released, and states could certainly make more of the reports public. Every state is at liberty to certainly uh, make the report public. That's a really quick and simple tool. For years, there's been a discussion about whitelists, right? Do you name and shame states that have not performed well? Maybe you don't release a report. Maybe every year you release a white list or a gray list, sorry, of states that haven't done well, or maybe a white list of states that have done quite well on compliance and have sought to address the gaps in their measures and things like that. I think I've heard it talked about for about 10, 15 years. It, it has not made any headway, So that, but that tool is there for states that want to use it. Um, we've seen a proliferation, not just of CT resolutions, but CT events in the council. Now that has pros and cons, right? The the cons are that you get a much bigger kind of CT agenda, you risk making these events start to look pro forma, and if pe the right people can't access the panels or the events, either as audience or speakers, you know, they can be sometimes questionable. But on the plus side, and again, having been part of these debates of why we have these events, they represent an effort to open up some of these council discussions to create some space for new speakers, new audiences, and for new debates, right, to, to be a bit more publicly aired. So states that choose to propose events, ARIA formulas, IIDs in the council, those are ways to get some of these issues out in the open. And, and you know, we've seen more and more states make use of that. Um, and certainly, of course, one of the best tools that states have developed and established is joining us on the panel. And I'm looking at Finola. It's hard to know if you can see on the panel, but having the special rapporteur and making sure that voice is, is heard and, and free to speak is, I think, one of the most important tools. I'm just going through what's available in the Security Council because I'm a realist and I don't see a huge change coming anytime soon in terms of the big picture working methods. But states can always if they choose name and shame a state or call for accountability, they have a voice in the council. And I think the danger is that too often states don't use their voice in the council. They wait for big changes. Um, you know, we've seen it a little bit, certainly with um, some of the, you know, some states have talked about what's happening in China and Xinjiang and all, but we haven't seen a wholesale use of the actual bully pulpit that is the Security Council um, to call for human rights compliance. So I think that's a tool and any states that might or may be listening to this, encourage them to take up that bully pulpit and call for that accountability. And, and just very quickly, I wanted to flag um, one thing, you know, Santiago also alluded to this, and I think this I've certainly seen in, in a lot of practices, the debates we're having on CT and human rights and a lot of the sort of detail of the council is unfortunately happening outside the sphere of a lot of practitioners. And I think that that disconnect is a bit of a danger. And, you know, you end up having CT practitioners speaking to said CT practitioners, human rights communities speaking within themselves. Um, we saw this a lot with the 
um, debate about humanitarian carve-outs and sanctions for a long time. There were a lot of humanitarian actors that were speaking internally, and it wasn't really moving the needle on CT because it wasn't really a, a bridge-building dialogue. There wasn't really a mixed discussion until you know five years ago or so. So I think it's really important to try and find some of those bridges where this discussion is not just happening within like intra human rights communities, intra rule of law communities, but actually it's hard to get, you know, sometimes CT practitioners on board, but it's very difficult to watch all these debates and the effort that's being put into getting the language right, building in mechanisms, trying to create posts where these things can be monitored only to feel like the, the CT folks themselves, who's behavior you're trying to change or, or influence are not actually part of the discussion and not even receiving some of these updates and changes and things like that. So I think um, opening up that that space for, for engagement, harder though it may be, is one of the critical ways to try and move the needle forward such as it may be. And um, I have to be an optimist in this business. So I'm going to say that I still, I, I hope there are ways forward on that despite the slightly darker climate that we are seeing these days. Noreen, thank you so much. Uh, a great um, compliment to what Fanula started with. Um, Lana, we'll uh, go to you uh, and hear from you now. Great, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for organizing such an important event. On what continues, as we heard from San Diego, uh, Fanula, as well as from Noreen, to be a timely issue. Um, uh, I would try to be optimistic and continue on the optimistic vibes that Noreen puts at the end, but it's uh, what I will focus in the next five minutes uh, uh, the, uh, on the misuse of counterterrorism measures and laws and the weaponization of the, these measures against the human rights defenders based on our experience at the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights. Through our Justice Defenders Program, um, the ABA Center for Human Rights coordinates pro bono legal assistance to at risk human rights defenders who face criminalization uh, for their human rights work. In the last 11 years, the ABA staff, uh, ABA Center for Human Rights staff, has supported cases of a human rights defenders facing uh, terrorism charges for exercising their rights to freedom of expression, association, and peaceful assembly. The prevalence, and as um, mentioned by Fanula, is alarming. Um, um, and Fanula in her report, uh, in 2018 report, indicated that since 2006, and as of uh, 2018, 66% uh, of the mandate communication dealt with the use of counterterrorism measures against civil society actors. Also, frontline defenders uh, noted that 58% of the cases that they track were of, a, were of a human rights defenders charged under counterterrorism and security legislation. So we heard uh, it's challenging, uh, and um, I apologize for repeating what's already been said, but the subsequent to the adoption of UN Security Council resolution and global counter tourism strategies, government have enacted a draft of laws and adopted measures to counter, uh, to counter terrorism. Um, with these, while these laws play an important role uh, in, in countering terrorism, some states have adopted vague and sweeping laws that are prone to arbitrary uh, and discriminatory application. Government conflate terrorism uh, with broader issues of national security, quashing peaceful dissent, uh, expanding surveillance powers, targeting religious and ethnic groups, and curtailing the uh, curtailing due process and fair trial rights under the guise of countering terrorism. What we find. Um, uh, what we found is that the tendency to misuse counterterrorism tools, laws, and policy for political motives is not limited to a specific country or a particular region. Governments in the Middle East and North Africa region have wielded broadly crafted uh, and vague anti-terror laws to silence human rights defenders. 
uh, given the general lack of uh, meaningful and independent uh, judicial oversight in these countries, the instrumentalization and weaponization of these measures against uh, human rights defenders and civil society actors becomes a common and da dangerous practice. Uh, the ABA Center for Human Rights staff documented how the Saudi specialized criminal court, the anti-terror court, um, uh, was used to target lawyers and the human rights defenders for exercising their civic freedoms. The misuse of counterterrorism authority, uh, authorities by the kingdom is not an unavoidable consequence of sincere efforts to combat uh, the serious threat uh, of terrorism in the region. To the contrary, a review of uh, prosecution in the counterterror court by the Financial Action Task Force found evidence that resources may have been diverted from serious trials to frivolous trials against activists. Um, similarly, in Eurasia, uh, including Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Belarus, ABA CHR staff have documented incidents where uh, states misuse and abuse their counterterrorism laws to target uh, human rights defenders. The use of vague and overly broad um, definition of terrorism and sweeping provision make it difficult to understand exactly what constitutes a criminal offense. Um, we've seen that criminal uh, counterterrorism laws that contradict the international principles of legality and predictability provide these authorities with unchecked power to search, arrest, detain, uh, prosecute HRDs, violating their fundamental freedom to free, uh, rights uh, and freedom um, uh, and right to privacy. Further, the access to funding for human rights group have been adversely impacted by the indiscriminate uh, implementation of uh, FATF uh, recommendation as mentioned by Funella. Instead of implementing a risk-based approach, some government choose to curb the illicit uh, financial flows by imposing broad and blanket restrictions across the nonprofit sector, uh, obstructing the legitimate, legitimate activities of these organizations. Uh, FATF has recently engaged in a stock taking, and this is a very promising step, and to see how to mitigate the unintended consequences resulting from the uh, incorrect implementation of the FATF standards, including de-risking, financial exclusion, and undue targeting of non-profit uh, organization. So just as I close, um, state using counterterrorism as a pretext to silence, discredit, or punish human rights defenders, as mentioned by Noreen, violating their obligation under international law. Uh, despite attempts by international regional bodies to counter increased prosecution of civil society under these laws, cases of harassment continue. And I would like to, to emphasize what's been mentioned by Fenilla and by Noreen in terms of the accountability mechanism and oversight and monitoring. These, provide, these laws provide states uh, uh, with immense powers. And if these powers are not effectively counterbalanced by oversight uh, and accountability mechanism, mechanism with meaningful uh, engagement and participation of civil society actors, then the potential for continued violation of a human rights will uh, only grow. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you also, Lana. Uh, I want to see if any of the, th the three of you, well, the four of you, including Santiago, would like to follow up uh, with any comments on what others have said. Yeah, if, if, Noreen, please just jump in. I just wanted, I wanted to ask Lana and Finola, um, because, you know, there was all this effort uh, to revise like the special recommendation aid and FATF, and there's been all this discussion that, you know, we've had for years trying to point out the, the impacts of de-risking and, you know, finally had the discussion on humanitarian exceptions. Do you feel like that's been helping? So, it, you know, do you feel like that is making a difference or is, it, is there still a lack of awareness or are there, 
is it just sort of too far gone for those kinds of revisions to make a difference? Um, or do you think we could do more with the special recommendation revision to try and address some of those issues? I mean, I'm happy. I just got back from the FATF private sector forum in Vienna last week. So I spent a week in Vienna with FATF and, and NGOs, the FATF uh, NPO coalition on FATF, which does amazing work. It's a really good question, Noreen. So, I mean, I think there's a couple of answers. The one is it remains to be seen how much political backing the unintended consequences project will get within the FATF, FATF plenary. That is yet to be seen. I think there are many states who are supportive. You could just imagine that there would be some states who would be less enthusiastic about the unintended consequences work because it will obviously seek to get at some things that states are concerned about. There is some discussion about recommendations to uh, revisions to recommendation eight. I think I have both, you know, there's both opportunity and a reason to be nervous about that. Um, FATF revised recommendation eight, and it's really clear that the risk based approach is about taking a risk based approach to the sector and to do so in an intelligent and structured way. And I so the danger is that if you open it up again, states who might actually you might not end up in a the danger of opening up text is that we end up in worse places than we started with. But it seems to me that the problem, in fact, lies in not that recommendation eight isn't clear and not that FATF secretariat hasn't been clear. But we have a problem both in terms of assessors understanding what states are doing. So it's kind of a downstream problem. But we also, I think, have a problem that actually states want to treat the entire NPO sector as high risk. There's really big advantages for states in saying all NGOs are problematic, all anybody who does nonprofit work is a high risk sector because the broader problem which Santiago has identified, which is around this question of like, what is happening to democracies? What's happening to governance in many societies? The logical and rational choice in closing space is to close space, right? So the logic of what's happening politically drives us in it, not to understanding that there's a technical fix to this issue. I think the technical fix is there already. State, states just need to implement appropriately a risk-based approach on recommendations. Aid. But actually, it's because there are broader political challenges for open societies, for good governance, for accountability in play, that the best technical fixes have nothing, unfortunately, to fix in that regard. It's a different measure and scale of problem. Lana, over to you. No, I, I think you cover it all, uh, Finola. It's, um, it's remained to be seen. Um, and um the 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 updated uh now they are thinking about updating the best practices uh as well as uh looking at the uh, recommendation eight revisions as well that's as well make me uh, a little bit nervous in terms of going back a few steps and governments will influence the whole process what i think uh find it very positive is that local civil society are more and more aware of these uh, processes and they are engaging whenever FATF undertake review that they start to, to talk about what's the, process, the impact of the implementation of these recommendations on their work. And that's open up a little bit of conversation with the FATF as, uh, as a body in terms of seeing what's the, the consequences of these uh, recommendations. Maybe just one footnote in that is that another key actor, and this is the private sector, many of the problems for civil society are coming from intermediary banks who are over-regulating. So I think we also have to have a really hard conversation with the private sector about its human rights obligations. <laughs> Over. <laughs> can, I, can I make a comment, uh, Dina? Yes, it's, it's more a question than a comment and a question to... to to all of you. And um, Noreen raised uh, something that is critical uh, for everything on human rights, which is, you know, the world accountability. And, and we keep uh, uh, talking about accountability and, and the lack of accountability in uh, human rights cases. 
in spite of the fact that we have an extraordinary uh, system, whether it's uh, universal, whether it's uh, regional, we do have a you know, very good system for accountability. If you start to think about you know, the European system, you know, the European Court, the Inter-American Commission, the Inter-American Court, the African Commission, the African Court, the UN with all its uh, different treaty bodies. I mean, we do have a system of accountability for human rights, but however, we always have problems with accountability. And definitely in this case, uh, uh, as Noreen pointed out, this is one of the main challenges we have. So my, my question is really an open question is, uh, when we talk about accountability in this uh, case, in this situation, in city issues, are we talking about what we already have? Are we talking about kind of political accountability? Are we talking about uh, judicial or quasi-judicial decision? What, what are we... What are we referring? What, what do we need, basically? Uh, of course, we always need political will and so on. But what what do you when you talk about accountability? What are we thinking about? What can we do different that is not happening right now? And maybe we can achieve something. Well, let me piggyback on that question. We talked a little bit about this in preparation for the. Um, for this panel, but um, you know, I guess the, the bottom line is: is the UN actually uh, constructive and relevant actor anymore? Uh, we, we, you know, we're seeing human rights deteriorating at the UN Council. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing it um, this, the accountability deficit that Noreen was talking about. And um, while you while Santiago pointed out all the systems that we have, the systems seem to be breaking down, if not altogether uh, broken. So what, what does that leave us with? Right. I mean, it, again, it's like, you know, I remember <clears throat> this is somewhat different, but, uh, you know, I remember cases in the inter-American system of uh, somewhat state-sponsored terrorism, that was uh, going after uh, indigenous communities, or it was going after human rights defenders in Colombia, and uh, and there were cases at the Inter American Court, and you know the, we, the the court found the government of Colombia responsible and accountable, and it was accountable for all those violations, um, and it did have a good impact to some extent, uh, but. When we talk about accountability on this issue, which is a lot more, you know, of course, universal, and uh, we do not have, and we do not have a human rights court, of course, so it will have to be some of the treaty bodies, which has kind of a lesser strength. Uh, are we talking about something new, or, or, or the political accountability, basically the naming and shaming, whether it's from other governments or from civil society is enough. That's the kind of thing I still don't, I mean, I, I always try to, what, what you know, we, we, we have identified a very clear problem. So what could be the solutions that we have, even, even though we know, even though we know that this is not the best, the best of times to think about, you know, new things to, to advance human rights. Is there something that you Noreen. think? You look like you're ready to speak. I, to that. Well, I know, and I don't want it to risk looking like I have an answer, just a more <laughs> complicated problem. <laughs> so I don't want to get everyone's hopes up. But I, you know, I think the the sort of prognostications of the UN's death, we we are hearing that a lot, right? I mean, it's it's hard not to feel that and see that when you when you look at news cycles and you look at the the wars and conflicts we have. Um, but you know, the I think the challenge is the UN is not just one thing. So are you asking if the Security Council is relevant to counterterrorism? Are you asking if the General Assembly is relevant? Are you asking if the humanitarian and human rights bodies are relevant? So I think there's a bit of a risk in saying whether the UN is relevant to this because it's not clear what this is and, and which UN. I think that, you know, I I do think that, you know, the council imperfect as it may be at times is the only one we've got. And it's the same with the GA. I, I prefer a world with with a blue flag than without one. Um, again, imperfect as it is. Um, but I think the UN can be used and each of its bodies can be used for what it's good for. Right. So that's why when I was talking about, you know, 
the tools that I think the council has to address the things it has put in place for CT. I tried to talk about very realistic, achievable things, you know, highlighting that, you know, states are putting a million people in labor camps and concentration camp like, you know, uh, areas in order to integrate them and, and sort of brainwash them and because of their religious beliefs, I think, you know, you can't call that CT and it's fair to call that out in the council. I think having an ARIA formula with, you know, practitioners that can talk about the risks to human rights defenders or the, the impacts, the gendered impacts on terrorism, but that's what the council can do. It doesn't have that kind of, you know, uh, enforcement mechanism. So I, I don't really have an answer. I just think that the answer to what accountability looks like depends a little bit on which body you're looking at um, and what tools it has available. And, you know, to, to my mind, the the fact that um, we have very few, uh, or if any, no, I don't think there's been any proposal for a designation on the CT sanctions list for someone who's perpetrated sexual violence or human trafficking that we, you know, see um, very globally, very low levels of sort of prosecutions for, for ISIL crimes, you know, or, or war crimes prosecutions for things ISIL has done. Th that to me is worrisome. And I, the fact that no states are getting called out formally for uh, some of the misuse, I think is worrisome. And there are states like the UK that have like an independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. So I don't think anything that's been said on this panel would be a surprise to folks in the UK, you know, who've heard these critiques before and I'm sure have like wonderful answers. Um, but um, so I just think it's a bit worrisome to kind of throw the baby at with the bathwater and say the UN isn't relevant. I think asking the You went to do things that it's not designed to do makes it not the right fit, if that helps. Yeah, a few thoughts. I was going to jump in and say, so I, I'm with Noreen on the, really it depends what question you're asking. So like, let's take on the simple question of accountability. There's two, from my perspective, two different questions of accountability. There's the accountability of non-state actors who have committed serious violations of international law including terrorism, but primarily war crimes, crimes against humanity, possibly genocide. And I think we've had an absolute, if we think of the most recent kind of the uh, caliphate of Iraq and Syria, we've had almost no accountability for the scalar human rights violations that took place there. And that deficit of accountability is a tinder kit for more violations, more cycles of violence in the future. This we know at absolute certainty. It doesn't, no rocket science required. But the answer to that question is complicated because the people who are being held mostly by a non-state actor in Northeast Syria who might be held accountable, their states won't bring them back. So we have hundreds, thousands of men imprisoned in, in jails in Northeast Syria, in a particular jail, many of whom may be responsible for serious violations of international law, but we have no political willingness to hold them accountable for their crimes, which involves either creating an ad hoc special tribunal or involves member states whose nationals are in those territories to bring them back and try them. Some states have done it. Germany has done it. We have one or two tiny examples of states being willing to do it. But this is a gap of the classic responsibility of states under a notion of state responsibility to hold their individuals accountable. May, At the may, national may I, level... May I, may I interrupt you on that one? Because yeah, sure. you've got a, why do you think states do not exercise more international uh, jurisdiction? I mean, this one is so, this one is very complicated, but and very simple. When you designate thousands of these people as the worst of the worst and the most serious terrorists ever on the planet, and then you bring that they're in a prison in Northeast Syria and you have to make the, the political decision to bring them home, that's not a good sell politically. This is the problem. We've created a political problem of our own making that makes it almost impossible to bring back children from Northeast Syria, much less the men. So, so the problem is a quintessentially political problem. It's not a legal problem. It's a, the legal problem is simple. It's you transfer, you, you have, there are some challenges of evidence. I don't want to undermine that we have issues of evidence, but we've seen states like Germany, there are ways to do this, to make sure that we hold, and we have troves of evidence, but there's been an unwillingness, I think, of investment in accountability 
And as we know, think of Bosnia as a good example. Even in the best case scenario where the international community is prepared to invest in hybrid or, or, or standalone institutions, the numbers that we will prosecute compared to the numbers who have been harmed is minuscule. That's the reality. So there's there's always this big gap between our kind of assumptions about big justice and our capacity to deliver big justice in the aftermath of significant atrocity. And I think we all struggle with that. Maybe on the second question though, how do we do about the accountability gap? The other piece we have to deal with then in the accountability gap is sometimes we have to make compromises we don't want to make with some of these groups. We have to talk about amnesty. We have to talk about truth rather than accountability. We have to talk about reparations instead of like classic justice. And again, once you put people in the terrorism box, that toolkit is much less available to you than it has been in, let's say, traditional armed conflicts, also for a variety of political reasons. But maybe on the state responsibility side of holding states accountable for their misuse of counterterrorism, I suppose I have a number of like small, I don't think, like Noreen, I don't think these are going to fix the bigger problem. But one is we need less counterterrorism. Frankly, states need to stop having the space to do this work domestically. They, and so Noreen has been one of the co-authors of a really important report that looks at the Security Council. And I think one of the things that that report does is it speaks to prudence on the Security Council. We don't need expansive counterterrorism resolutions on the Security Council. And that work would be because that creates the space for abuse to occur in and less is more, actually. So one of the ways to solve this problem institutionally is to create less space for states to have the opportunity to use counterterrorism. The other thing we need, which frankly wouldn't be so hard because we have a Security Council resolution that gets us most of the way there, um, 1566, is this, the agreement on the global a treaty on terrorism. Let's let's have a definition of terrorism agreed by states. So then the gap between what states are doing and what is actually a genuine threat of terrorism is, is closed. And I would say the UN needs to seriously get out of the business of supporting counterterrorism at national level. I think we have a serious legitimacy, structural, down the road it will bite you problem from the scale of capacity building and technical assistance going into member states who are engaged in abusive practices. And I'll close by the example of Mali. We've spent, I don't know, the last decade throwing a lot of money, resources, capacity into Mali. And I was in Mali last summer for the mandate. You couldn't go 37 miles outside of Bamako because it wasn't safe. You couldn't go anywhere in Bamako without an armored vehicle if you were a UN staff, because the UN itself is now a target, because they've engaged in stabilization missions that supported a government. And the government is an over, has overthrown the democratically elected regime and is in the business of cooperating with a Russian mercenary group to do its counterterrorism these days. So the UN runs serious substantial risks in its current support to CT. So that's not a fix, but I think we have to narrow the space upon which the work of counterterrorism is done to limit the ground upon which abuse, exploitation, and the facilitation of more violence is, is occurring. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Lana, did you want to speak to this? Um, uh, just a quickly, uh, Noreen and uh, um, Fenola cover it all. I think I agree with Fenola is to shrink the counterterrorism space at the UN Security Council. What is the the convenient justification uh, coming from state is that they are implementing um, what has been decided at the international level. And I, I know the causality is not there, but this is what we hear from governments when they are faced on the, uh, on the question of misuse and abuse of counterterrorism measures and laws. And I think there is a pressing need to, to, to have the global treaty on terrorism that will solve the problem of the, the vague definition of terrorism and to to limit states from using sweeping overly 
uh, and broadly crafted uh, legislation on uh, on uh, terrorism. The again, um, probably it's more shrinking the space on counterterrorism at the Security Council, but as well opening a meaningful engagement of civil society actors. They will bring the voices and what's happening at the national level. And this is will create an opportunity to look at seriously at what these counterterrorism measures done at the national level and how to mitigate these uh, harmful results of from these counterterrorism measures. Thanks. You know, I, I'm curious to know, I'd like to know what you think are uh, um, useful examples of, of national legislation. I mean, can we look to any states that are that are actually doing something uh, helpful, constructive with their counterterrorism regulation? I mean, I'll offer one good example from, I did a country visit to Belgium in 2018 in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist attacks in Molenbeek in the airport. It was a really difficult time. It was enormous shock to the body politic in Belgium. And this is a country that had been peaceful, that didn't see itself as having a terrorism problem, although large numbers of Belgian nationals had actually traveled to Syria in the early part of the, after at the sort of 2011, 2012. And the Belgian government, I remember having this conversation with the Belgian, because I had just done a country visit to France, which had taken a very specific response to the terrorist attacks that had taken place there, also equally horrific. But Belgium made the decision that it wasn't going to seek a range of exceptional counterterrorism powers. It made that decision deliberately. It made it thoughtfully. There was a very challenging conversation within what was a, a coalition government but a view that there were some small augmentations. So a good example is at the time, Belgian law didn't allow you to pick somebody up at their house uh, until morning. You could never arrest somebody at night, <laughs> which is a bad idea if you're trying to do effective counterterrorism. They said, well, we need to change that. And they had, they had a very strict law on charging people within 24 hours, which was way below the European average. So they changed that so that they could hold someone for up to four days, consistent with the European Convention on Human Rights. But they didn't go wholesale. They went retail. They made these retail adjustments to their national law in a balanced response. And that is so rare because most countries faced with terrorist attacks, we get the Patriot Act. We get the Silk Law in France. We get the Prevention of Terrorism Act 1973 in Northern Ireland. I mean, states generally, if there's this enormous emotional rush to show that you're doing something, the politics of performance in counterterrorism, much, much harder to say to your community, no, we're going to do less. We're going to use our existing law effectively and we're going to assess what we need in a thoughtful way. And so that's a really good example, but very few countries do it. Thanks. Um I want to encourage people to uh, put questions that you might have or comments that you might have in the uh, in the Q and A, uh, and we do have one question which I, I'll share read out is uh, it's from Judge Delissa Ridway. Um, she writes, "I'm aware that the European Court of Human Rights has repeatedly condemned Turkey's counterterrorism legislation as overly broad and in, and incredibly vague. Has the European Court?" similarly condemned the legislation of other states? What about other tribunals? Do such judicial condemnations have any real impact? Yeah, I can answer that. There, there is a, there's, um, so there's been consistent, it, it's not relevant anymore, but during the course of the use of emergency powers in Northern Ireland from 1973 until approximately the end of the conflict, the European Court examined the use of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the uh, Emergency Provisions Act, which were the two pieces of <laughs> Northern Irish legislation and found them wanting on similar grounds. Um, We've seen the same approach to the Greek um, when Greek used military powers after the coup. So those are two examples. Thanks. What do do any of the others? Do you want to share anything? Well, um, Judge Ridgeway also had a comment, which I'll read. Um, sh she said that she just returned uh, on Monday from Morocco, uh, 
And at customs in Marrakesh, there's a prominent sign, declare your drones. Just a few years ago, we could never have even imagined that drones would be so pre prevalent that we would see something like that. Which this obviously speaks to the proliferation of technology and the fact that whatever states have, it rapidly makes its way into the private sector. And to, to me, that's a that's a perfect segue into the question that I wanted to to, to uh, explore some more, which is uh, the the question of um, um, of technology and, and intrusive technology. And, and uh, Fanula, you have I think this was already mentioned, but you have a new report on new technologies. It'd be great if you could say some some more about that. There's a there's been some discussion, and you and you call for it also for a moratorium on the transfer of surveillance technology. Um, the problems of global, uh, maybe a global prohibition on um, lethal autonomous weapon systems, drones, what have you. Right. Um, can you say, do you speak to that? And, and then maybe the, the others can too. Yeah, no, on drones, I think one of the things that's really important and and the mandate has a position paper and my, both of my pre predecessors, Ben Emerson and um, and Martin Scheinin took strong views on the use of um, drones, particularly in sort of overseas extraterritorial use of, of, of lethal autonomous weapons, where the territorial, the questions of the legality of use is, again, encroachment both on the sovereignty of the territorial state upon which the, the weapon is being used, the question of civilian harm from the use of these weapons, the authorization for the use of force, particularly by U.S., um, and the sort of broad lack of transparency that has historically accompanied the use of, of lethal autonomous weapons. But I think I'm going to sound like one of my teenage kids when I say that discussion is so 2020, because I think the problem we have right now is of an entirely different order, which doesn't mean that the problem of the extraterritorial use of force by lethal weapons is not a question of concern. And I think post Afghanistan, as the US moves to an over the horizon strategy in relation to the management of strategic threats in countries and where it no longer has a territorial presence, those issues remain live. But actually what we're seeing is the vast proliferation of drone technology and Judge Widgeray is right, it's proliferating at a speed that is like lightning. And um, number, what we are seeing, what the mandate has been tracking, tracking has been the use of drones in uh, police uh, oversight of uh, marches, protests, social movements. And um, we see the increased use of drones in the protection of so-called critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure being things like schools, um, hospitals, military installations, and so on, but also can be public buildings. And, and the thing to remember is when a drone sits above you, it's swapping up all of the information of, about everything in it. So that metadata is coming in. Many of the countries deploying these drones have no data, data protection, none. So whatever you're, whatever's being scooped up around you, there's no protection, nor are there often any limitations on the transfer of that information to other states, including states that have incredibly poor human rights records. So the drone question, and one of the things I just, um, I I teach laws of war and I I have my students build drones. My, my, my law school will pay for a bunch of drones to be purchased so that students can build them. It's incredibly easy to build a drone. Your teenager could build a drone with little difficulty. And the move to weaponizing drones is actually really from your kind of bog standard buy in a supermarket drone mm -hmm. to build a drone that can be weaponized. That move is very, very limited. Technologically, it's not a difficult move. And so that points to the danger as we proliferate drones that we're going to get more non-state armed group of drones. And the mandate has identified 15 non-state armed groups currently using drones in a significant way. I think that number is likely to be conservative in a year's time, given the scale of use it's going to be spreading. So we should all be worried about the use of drones by police forces in somewhere near us. The first uh, police uh, adoption in North America was in North Dakota, because one of the challenges you see is that these things are sold cheaply as offset military um, sales to police forces. So just some really big issues about regular law enforcement using drones, both for surveillance and for lethal uh, capacity in terms of crowd control. And maybe just to say on spyware, the mandate has also issued a report. We're seeing massive misuse of spyware technology 
in evidence to the European Parliament last year, the NSO group, which would have been asked to give evidence to the parliament, estimated that it was cover currently uh, tracking information on 12,000 individuals. And for those who don't know, when, this, when a spyware technology goes on your phone, it's not a click technology anymore. You, won't, you probably won't even know it's there. And it's not just collecting information on you, it's collecting information on everybody Everybody in your address book, everybody you send a photograph to, everybody in your email, it, it is extraordinarily powerful. And it can also alter data in your phone without you even knowing that the data has been altered. So enormous, enormous issues here for us all. So, Noreen, did you want to? Yes, please. You're on, you're on mute. Most people are happy about that, but um, <laughs> I think uh, my family's still trying to figure out how to do that. Um, I think that it, it is, you know, I'm not, Fanola said everything, you know, clearly about, about drones and stuff like that, but I, I just, one of the challenges I find is we are always going to be lagging a little behind, right? We keep talking about ICTs and new technology and, you know, 15 years ago, we we're talking about internet and communication technologies. Now we're going to be talking about chat GPT and AI and, you know, you're going to have AI generating incidents or things or responses and, and, you know, how do we manage that? So I think, you know, there is going to be a need to figure out how to manage public private partnerships. And I know they're difficult and challenging and tricky, but, you know, one of the other things we've seen, for example, we've just been working on, you know, how, how far right terrorists are, are um, or far right groups, for example, have been targeting critical infrastructure, but the sites that they've been targeting are all the purview of businesses, right? They're businesses that have not gone to the council, right? any resolutions don't think about human rights protections or ct legislation but they're going to have to get involved in the business of either preventing or protecting their sites and things so i just wanted to say that i think right now our emerging technologies discussion is drones tomorrow it's going to be ai or today ai and chat gpt and you know it still is you know that interface between the the tech companies and, and the public and things like that so I think, you know, there, there was the business and human rights initiative, right, at the UN, something like that we could think about in terms of um, the CT space. I think, well, many of those will be relevant, you know, when we talk about businesses, but I think the challenge is that many of these entities, whether they're going to become targets, whether they need to become allies, whether they are part of the problem or, you know, a little bit of both in every place, there's going to have to be some kind of conversation between um, public private entities. And I think that um, getting that right and trying to work on those is going to be critical because emerging technologies, we can use that term for the next 20 years, but the technology we talk about is going to change day by day. And we're always going to be lagging behind from a government and IO perspective. So um, I think, in fact, intra-council discussions will only regulate or seek to regulate one aspect of activity, right? As more of this moves into those kind of spaces. And you do have 13-year-olds printing guns or building drones or, um, you know, I don't know, hacking into your computer. How you manage that, how you protect critical infrastructure and power grids and bank ATMs from, you know, individual far-right actors and things. We're going to have to figure out how to have that constructive interface. So it's not Lana, really a solution, yeah. but a proposal. No, very helpful. Lana, did you want to speak to this? I, I just like, it's difficult to come after Finola and Noreen. <laughs> this uh, very tough, but just uh, on, in terms of the spyware, it's been misused and been implanted as uh, Finola mentioned as a zero click uh, message, uh, implanting uh, in human rights defenders uh, phone and using some of the evidence in the charges against them under counterterrorism law. So there are so many, like the these technologies, the drone, the spyware, everything has been misused by state and non-state actors. And I think the, 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 the point uh, raised by Noreen in terms of public and private partnership is really much needed. And to look at these companies in terms of a human right to due diligence, in terms of selling these technologies and 
being engaging with government with poor human rights records. That is an important thing to bring these kind of conversation as well to this, this community that we work as a human rights movement, working away as well to a certain extent from these kind of conversation. It's worth, thank you, thank you. It, it's worth noting um, that the ABA is, is scheduled to, there's a, there's a resolution from the ABA that is now circulating and I, I gather it'll be considered in February at the House of Delegates, I thought sooner, but uh, on spyware. And it, um, it calls for a moratorium on the sale, purchase, use of commercial spyware, um, and uh, urges um, the ABA's urging, would urge the US Department of Commerce to continue to add to the entity list of commercial spyware manufacturers to pursue targeted sanctions against them. It'd be interesting. We, I don't know if, you're, if you, any of you were aware of this resolution. Uh, we could certainly make it available to you, but um, I'd love to hear what you what you all think of it. I mean, without me, I would just starting to see we're starting to see some movement on spyware technology. Certainly, Costa Rica is leading an initiative of over now I think a large group of states, not just Grulac states, um, seeking a moratorium on the use of this kind of technology. And we've had um, an executive order from the president, President Biden, just in the last couple of weeks um, around the federal use. And we've seen the UK and France agree that they're going to have a conversation about how they want to think about the regulation of spyware so there's there's some shifts in the ether and um, i would say that like we my mandate's position has been well ultimately we think a moratorium may be appropriate my deep concern is that we're a long way out of the gate to put a moratorium in place and we have made the argument that we also have to, in parallel, be having a discussion about regulation of spyware. So that includes things like tech uh, export controls, putting in place some certain minimals that um, would apply to the use of spyware. I mean, recognizing that we're a long way away from the days of wiretapping phones because nobody has a phone in their house anymore. So for police purposes, People, there is an understanding that we have sophisticated um, tools being used by both criminals and people engaged in terrorism and other forms of nefarious violence, where there are genuine reasons why some law enforcement capacities may be need to make use of technology. So I think none of us would dispute that. I think that the, the, the spot is how do we, there may be parts of spyware that are simply unregulable and therefore should be outlawed. But I think we also have to have a realistic parallel conversation about what does the, what would the content of regulation look like? And the report I've just issued sets out for member states what a minimal content of any regulatory framework on spyware would look like, which includes things like, for example, a spyware can never be lawful if it doesn't keep a record of where it's been. A spyware can never be lawful if it can alter data on your device and it doesn't hold a record. If you can't do those two things, then that spyware should be, should be banned. But if you can do those things, if you can keep a record and if it's clear that if things are altered, they are accessible, where there isn't a kill switch on spyware, then we might need to have another conversation about regulating some forms of spyware and not others. So I think that's the more complicated conversation to have. Lana, I'll give you a chance to jump in before Marie, if you have, or uh, Mark, Santiago. I was one of the change uh, the topic if i may uh, and this um, on on the issue of uh, accountability again and uh, you know we spoke mainly about uh, different forms of uh, accountability through multilateral mechanisms uh, i know this is a complicated issue but uh, what would be your uh, evaluation of unilateral uh, decisions by some governments to either name and shame or to uh, uh, you know, put san sanctions to certain individuals and things like that. Is that working or, or not? I mean, I know it's a very you know, difficult and open question, but uh, with an open answer, but uh, what, what's your, in general, what's your view regarding uh, uh, unilateral decisions in that respect? to any of you. 
Noreen, do you want to jump first from your? I, I can see you answer. No, you can go ahead. Um, no, go ahead. I mean, I think the answer is it's complicated, right? There's no so right. Um, so I think the there is an enormous power to to uni, unilateral measures. Uh, you know that there's another language that's used to describe in the sanctions unilateral course of measures is the terminology that some states use to decide sanctions that are used unilaterally by one state, particularly vis-a-vis -vis other states. Um, I think human rights actors and counterterrorism actors are not opposed to the use of sanctions per se as a tool. Mm -hmm. I think my position would be, though, that we need a number of adjacent things to the tool. One is that, in general, I think the general rule is multilateral is better than unilateral, right? That's obvious. It's just, but it means that um, the effectiveness or perceived fairness of procedure is often increased when more states are involved than less. The reality is that getting agreement from more states is harder. So sometimes that's just not a luxury we have. I think the second is that I think we, if we're going to put sanctions on an individual in particular, but also on countries, we have to have exemptions that address issues of uh, humanitarian action. And we've just seen the Security Council, particularly in the, in the counterterrorism arena, put in place at the end of last year um, an, an exemption on on, on sanctions regimes to facilitate humanitarian action. Um, but if it's for individuals, we need robust due process rights. Sanctions are like a form of civil death for many individuals. And there's been lots of criticism, including from me, about the use of sanctions uh, for individuals designated under US sanctions regimes, um, including the quality of the intelligence data that puts them on those lists and what that means. And um, the final thing I guess I would say on sanctions is I think we can overuse sanctions. Some states, I'm not going to mention any names, but just say there's at least one state who likes to use sanctions a lot. And I think that can come at the expense of sometimes doing the other work that's required to get effective change from other states, meaning sanctions can become an overly used tool and become a fu fundamentally ineffective because they become a shortcut on doing some of the other kind of multilateral work that's required to change behavior. So that's just, that's my... No, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, we have just a few more minutes left and there's a couple of um, comments that are coming in and I want to invite others to to add one or two before I invite our panelists to give us um, any last words. But uh, um, Lourdes Benes, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, uh, wrote, thank you all. As spyware, even if it leaves a record, the problem starts with accessing without authorization. Uh, on that token, wouldn't that disqualify it from the get-go unless someone allows it, which would very likely, except for the programs that allow that allow you to be in touch with your family, which are different, but to some level are monitoring your activities. Though it's fair to think that spyware deployment in general has far more serious purposes and consequences. Again, thank you. I mean, I would just say that if a law enforcement body has a good reason to believe that you're trafficking, I don't know, a million dollars of fentanyl across the border, 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 there may be a good reason to use an intrusive technology to track what you're doing. Now, that's, again, I think the bar to use certain kinds of technologies that have this global capacity to access more than particular in for every piece of information on your phone would have to be set higher than others. I don't think that, I think we should assume for starting purposes that there may be, if we're going to have a reasonable conversation with law enforcement and other interests and to assume there are some legitimate interests in states having some tools at their disposal and that and that some of these other technological tools are at the disposal of, of armed groups, criminal actors and um, right-wing extremists, I mean, all of the above, then I think barring states from absolute use of certain technology may not be where we will get a consensus on state behavior. If we take the point of consent, I mean, we'd never have got a wiretap on anybody in any jurisdiction anywhere, ever. So I think that's not the starting point from a, from a, from a legal perspective. But I think there's a balance of rights in the discussion. It's not a, this isn't a, this isn't an unlimited pass on access. And again, given the nature of this technology and its intrusiveness, 
and it's a capture to its ability to capture everybody else in your orbit, then I think that the, the normative stand, legal standard for allowing such a thing would have to be higher. Uh, you know, uh, Lord, this is, uh, this is the difficulty of not having access to a uh, conversation with participants, but she was clarifying some of, of what she wrote earlier. She said that her her concern is is generally on rule of law, on human rights and democracy, and that um, she's she understood, she understands that for leg legitimate law enforcement, there would have to be due process. But what would you say? I mean, this is the civil society space, I think, right? And rule of law issue. Lana, do you want to say anything? I hate to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> so definitely it's in terms of, uh, definitely there is, should be, as Finola mentioned, it's just like needs to be a due process for every step uh, without having this clarity and uh, knowing what's the consequences for the violation. That will be really, uh, harming and counter uh, productive to the issue that we want to for the legitimate cause uh, or for the legitimate reason that we are using these uh, tools uh, to protect citizens uh, etc da, 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 da. but when it comes to without having a clarity and the regulation then that will be subject to misuse and abuse I just, I just wanted to flag, like, I know we're short on time, so just a very quick point that, you know, this conversation is also so much bigger than CT, right? I mean, one of the biggest sort of rubrics for intrusion into our daily lives was COVID protocols and, and the use of COVID as a way to monitor who you're bumping into on the subway and things like that. So I think the challenge is when if, you know, if we're looking for a CT solution to this, it won't address you know, a tenth of all these issues. So I think that's also the challenge. There are things that, you know, CT can be a small part of or things that are in the bigger picture that are playing out in the CT space. And just if you fix it in the CT space, it's not going to address a lot of that. So I think that's a big challenge. Also going back to your question, Dina, is the UN useful on this? But this is such a bigger question that, you know, if you've got a perfect resolution out of the Security Council tomorrow with every kind of accountability mechanism. And I know this will never happen, but you know, if it were to happen, it still then wouldn't address the next time the state tries to use, you know, COVID as a means to like call me up every day. Um, so I just think that's part and parcel of the challenge that, you know, a lot of the dynamics we're talking about affect CT, CT affects them, but they're not just CT issues and, and therein lies some of the challenge, right? But sorry, I know, I know we're short on time. I shouldn't have just made it more problematic. It's, it's important and we appreciate you, you expanding it that way. Uh, Fanula, did you want to add something? Well, I was just going to say briefly that I'm in, I agree with Noreen, as I often do, which is that I think this isn't, but the, the, this isn't a CT problem. The regulation of tech, these kinds of high risk technologies, biometrics is a good example. The problem I would say is that the, that part of the challenge is, is that the regulation is starting in the CT space. So we have from last year, a security council meeting in New Delhi, where the security council is starting to regulate new technologies by issuing or offering guidance to states. And I would say we may have, this is like one piece of a bigger puzzle. It should not start from the CT perspective. The cyber treaty is regulating a whole bunch of issues in Vienna for the next year, probably. And so I think one of the dangers here is, I'm, I, I agree entirely, it's not a CT problem, but there is a danger that CT spaces will be used to advance regulatory answers mm -hmm. in ways that are narrower than the problem deserves. Yeah. Thanks. I want to... Um... We do have to wrap this up and uh, this has really been wonderful and I'm very, very pleased that it's been recorded so others can um, can listen to it. Uh, we'll go backwards in, in order. Lana, do you wanna give some last um, comments? Or, or it's it's there. The As we continue to have no definition of what terrorism is, constitutes and we will continue to see member states using the Security Council uh, resolution and the global counterterrorism strategy as a justification, as a pretext to uh, to uh, to adopt um, legislation that's 
could be used and this continue to be used against uh, human rights defenders. And to close the space, uh, we need to, to, to shrink again back to the points been made over in the last uh, 90 minutes. We need to close the space uh, of counterterrorism and the Security Council and open the space for civil society uh, engagement, meaningful engagement. Thanks, Lana. Noreen? I feel like the middle child. Um, <laughs> either direction I was going to be in the middle. Um, I think, you know, part of the challenge is, and, you know, as someone who's worked on CT and the council and all, it's hard for me to say I sh it should be rolled back because there are things I think that were very valuable in there. And I think that had they not at least had a chance to be discussed in the council, it could have been even worse. And I think there is value in debating and, and having some kind of council framework on some of this stuff, you know, certainly uh, not everything all the time, everywhere all at once. Um, but I, you know, I think part of the challenge is that very few states, like no state will step up to roll back the last 20 years and, and no single state can. So I would urge you know, those working with states and the states themselves sort of not to shy away from using the smaller tools at their disposal, because if we can't, you know, turn back the clock, if we're not going to undo things, again, this is why I come at the tools that exist, you know, um, you could pass a resolution and put in a sunset clause, you could put in, you know, more transparent working methods, you could name and shame, adopt a gray list or a white list. What I just worry about is that, you know, having talked about the dangers of an expansive undefined framework if if the only answer is roll it back states will say well no we're not going to and it's hard to roll back 20 years of, of binding legislation and and it needs more than one state <laughs> um so i just i would urge states to really look for every opportunity to try and address you know where the fix is pick up the fix because it really has expanded out of control and there are things that member states can do and you know civil society advocacy has been so important in highlighting all these issues but the issues aren't new anymore we know about the de-risking issue we know about the targeting of activists we know about the impacts on gender and that's been because civil society actors have put all these issues out there and they've come on to the formal record of the council now it really is on those states that are championing human rights those states that profess to be kind of champions of the the rule of law and human rights to really kind of um do something about it. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Sorry, thanks. Um, Fanula. Yeah, I guess I would just close by saying, I think we need a seriously pruned architecture. So I, I think that doesn't mean we don't. I'm with Nori. The architecture is not going to go away, but a, short, uh, a fit for purpose, tighter, shorter, more focused architecture would be one solution to this. The second would be at the UN level, the implementation of its due diligence policies when it engages in capacity building and technical assistance to member states. That's like a very pedantic fix, but it is a fix to make sure that you actually have to assess the risk of doing some of these work, this work in the countries that you do it and then stop if there is demonstrated risk, which is actually demonstrated in large numbers of the countries. And I would also say that I do I, I do believe that led by countries like India, who've had a longstanding interest in conclusion of a global treaty, that if the same kind of energy were attached to the, we've seen a huge amount of energy around a treaty on crimes against humanity. Let's get some of that energy back into counterterrorism because it's possible. We've seen it in other areas. And I think we just haven't had the willingness of states to do it, but I think there is room for that. Finally, I think we just need more transparency. Like those reports, that those reports to CTED were public till 2006. You can find them on the internet. So it's there's ways to find out what states are doing and for states to argue for transparency. And I think that would help. At the national level, I think we need oversight of counterterrorism. If we're going to talk about seriously pruning the global space, we actually have to hold states it's accountable domestically. And the way you do that is to go to Santiago's point. Some of it is around sanctioning. When they're misusing and abusing, then you put them on lists. Or 
it figures into the decisions you make about bilateral aid. This is happening right now for Sri Lanka in relation to its preferred trade status with the European Union, simply because it has failed to address its PTA problem over the past decade. The EU is saying, mm, you haven't fixed your CT problem. We're, we're going to give you some difficulty on your preferred trade status problem. So I think there are ways to fix this. They're not all, there isn't a single fix, but there are multiple fixes. And at the heart of it, to go back to Lana's points, is continuing to engage independent civil society in some of the fixes. Because if you're going to address insecurity in society, the people who know best how to do that are the people who experience it every day. So, Manila, thank you. And, and I want to give the last word to uh, Santiago. Uh, uh, thank you, Dina. Finula covered a little bit of what I was thinking about uh, saying, but basically, you know, I. You know, since 1948, we have created the, the most incredible architecture to to protect human rights, and uh, and the main issue is is accountability, as as uh, Nonit mentioned. And um, and here we have an issue that is probably one of the most relevant issues in, in our times. And uh, we have somehow we have a lesser level of accountability than with other issues. Uh, you know, we don't have regional mechanism, we, we don't have the treaty bodies. So it's kind of a, an issue that is critical for the protection of human rights and for the rule of law and many other things. And however, we have not been able to find the right way to, you know, to, to reach for accountability. And I think that's that's the challenge we have. Thank you. There, there are enormous challenges. And, and this has been a, a really interesting conversation. I, I really appreciate all uh, four of you for being part of it. Um, I want to thank also the, the I, I hope there are a number of people who are still um, joining, who are still with us uh, as participants listening in. I think there's a more than a dozen at least, but I wanted to, to uh, mention that as, as you know, this is a week-long webathon, and tomorrow it continues um, at 11 a.m. Eastern, 1500 um, GMT and 1700 uh, Central European time with a panel that will be discussing Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the influence on businesses and implications for lawyers. So um, to register for that, we have just put the, um, the link for registration, please, in the chat which is available now. So please go to that, click on the link and register for tomorrow's tomorrow morning's program. And there is another uh, one on um, it, the impact of um, global accountability. I, have, I do not have the title, I'm totally blanking on it, but tomorrow afternoon, excuse me. Um, please do join us. Thank you very, very much, all of you for being part of this. Thanks to you. Have a good yeah. afternoon, evening. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.